Hello, hello, welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains naturally occurring, I guess. I don't know. That, that was a weak one. I apologize. And today, we are going to discuss what is considered the worst rail disaster in Swedish history. This is a request from some fans I have over in Sweden, and I thought it was an interesting topic that not many people have discussed. This is the story of the Geta Railroad Disaster. Now, I want to preface this video with the fact that there's just so many Swedish words involved here. I've attempted to understand the pronunciation of all of them to the best of my ability. However, I know how I am, and I just want to let you know that I can almost guarantee I will mispronounce something at some point, but I'm going to do my best. Geta, which I'm almost positive is how you say it, is a town that's now part of the municipality of Norrköping in Sweden and it is the site of a terrible accident that occurred on the 1st of October, 1918. I feel like 1918 was just a really bad year in general for trains. I mean, America had both their worst train wrecks in 1918, and apparently Sweden did too. I mean, everyone was complaining about 2020, but 1918, oof. The accident involved a mixed train as part of Swedish state railways. It consisted of a locomotive and 10 cars. A mail car, two freight cars, five passenger cars, a dining car, and a sleeping car. The locomotive was an SJF class, number 1200. The F classes were constructed between 1914 and 1916, and they were 462 Pacific types, and they were actually extremely good. With high speed, good tractive effort, they were impressive pieces of work. And on that day, number 1200 was operating in accordance with protocol. There was nothing wrong with the train, actually. Not in any way. Not with the cars, not with the locomotive. The station guard who was on duty at Geta heard telephone wires vibrating between 6.33 and 6.40, which is not normal under any circumstances, and it was only some time later when people realized what had actually happened. There was an embankment down the line from Geta, and in order to build the track, they had carved into it. This embankment had a layer of clay, and due to heavy rains, the bearing capacity of it had diminished, a landslide was beginning, and the whole thing had come down sometime between 6.52 and 6.55 taking with it the telegraph network that ran along the railway line. Number 1200's train, which was train 422, was actually running late, and she had pulled out of Norpik King Station 12 minutes behind schedule. The practice in Sweden was that the next station down the line would always be contacted by telegraph using a symbol signal, tag ut, once the train had left the previous station, that way they knew the train was on the way. Train 422 had not pulled out till 654. This was after the telegraph lines had already come down and the next station, in Krokek, had tried to contact the other station to see why they had not received the tag out, as they knew a train was due and should be on the way by now, but they couldn't reach the station. At 67, Abbey Station in Norkoping tried to reach Krokek Station, and they realized that they couldn't get a response either. Something was wrong, but nobody could contact the train. As it traveled down the line, it was believed to have been going at least 65 kilometers an hour, or 40 miles per hour. Engineer Wolstrom looked on in horror as the landslide came into view. Locomotive number 1200 was the first to go off the rails. She slid down the embankment and came to rest on her right side on the road below it. The cars between the locomotive and the dining car were completely destroyed by the accident, and the dining car partially slid down the embankment as well. The last two cars on the train actually stayed on the rails. Engineer Wolstrom had actually hit his head in the accident, and he had a really bad concussion, but he managed to drag himself out of the locomotive to safety. The train's conductor, Mr. Strom, was in the last passenger car at the time of the accident, so he was still on the tracks. He climbed off the car and headed towards the locomotive to check on Wolstrom. Wolstrom was still conscious and informed him that his stoker, Carlson, was actually buried underneath the coal. With no way to contact anybody from where they were at, Strom headed back towards Abbey Station to inform them about the accident, and on the way he met one Mr. Anderson, who was a track walker. Mr. Anderson went to a nearby house and called Abbey to tell them what had happened. 
Another track walker, Erickson, arrived from his house east of the accident site. Once he realized the scale of the accident, he went off to get a halt to notify Krokek Station about what had happened. As this was all going on, embers from the locomotive's boiler had started to ignite the dry wood in the badly damaged passenger cars. Many of the people that had survived got out of these cars before this occurred, but some were trapped, and as the fire spread, they were consumed alive by it. Out of 170 people that were on board the train, 42 died, and 5 people were reported missing. There were also 41 people that sustained injuries, and the accident was bad enough that the line would be closed down for over 2 months until the 21st of December, 1918. The investigation that followed, that was launched by the Royal Railroad Board, focused on a few factors relating to the crash. The first part of the inquiry tried to determine what had caused the coaches to catch on fire, as they considered this a major hazard if it was something that could be prevented. They thought it might be the acetylene gas that had been used in the lighting, but further examination showed that it was actually the burning coal from the engine. It actually had nothing to do with the gas. The rest of the inquiry actually looked at the cause of the accident from a geological perspective, as early on it was pretty clear that what had happened was kind of an act of God. It wasn't necessarily any one person's fault, certainly not the employees on board the train, who had no idea there had been a landslide, or anybody at the stations for that matter. There had been no time to check out the tracks, it had happened so quickly. But the Geotechnical Commission of the Swedish State Railways wanted to know why there had been a landslide. As it turned out, there was actually a prehistoric landslide in this same spot hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years prior to the accident. This prehistoric landslide had actually increased the flow of water in that spot, causing the hill to erode a lot more quickly than the engineers responsible for laying the tracks would have believed at the time. These exceptional circumstances were suggested as the reason why it was believed that the bearing capacity of the soil was greater than it really was. In fact, in 1923, another landslide occurred in that same spot. This time, it caused the road running along Bravik Bay to collapse. This particular stretch of track was actually very new. It had only been open for five years, so there really hadn't been any previous signs that anything was amiss until this catastrophic thing occurred. As a result, it was ruled that the accident was simply something that was overlooked due to ignorance, not apathy and no one was held directly responsible for the accident, though changes were made to the design of the hill to try to prevent this from happening ever again. The track was shifted one meter towards the side of the mountain, and they reinforced the embankment with rocks. That particular stretch of line also had a speed limit reduction to just 15 kilometers an hour. The line's still there in modern times, although nowadays the speed has been set at a flat 100 kilometers an hour. Though based on what I know, there haven't been any accidents as a result of this since this 1918 disaster. Today, there are two monuments that stand as a testimony to what happened on that day. The first is at the site of the accident along the old road between Abbey and St. Vicken. And the second is located at Nora Kirkogarten, a cemetery in Norkoping. Many of the victims of the crash couldn't be identified, and they were buried in a mass grave. Though, in a surprising twist, the locomotive herself, F-1200, was rebuilt after the accident, and is still around today. She remained in service with the Swedish State Railways until 1937, when she was sold to the Danish State Railways, who would continue to use her for many years to come. In fact, during World War II, on the 21st of April 1943, she was hit by an air raid, but fixed again, and in 1963, she was returned to Sweden and put on display at the Swedish Railway Museum, where she's considered to be in running condition. And before we close, a special thank you goes out to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Some Dude 267, Brightline Blue, Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Tribal Typhoon, Dark Lightning 1536, Master of None, Josh Johnson, and Lock Kraken. Till next time. This is Darkness, and a bit well a fond farewell.